all right welcome back everybody dad talk with your boy jay blues i am sorry i am sorry let me apologize from the bottom of my heart i'm sorry for not posting in so long i really had to go on the grind and provide for my kids um i believe a man should provide for his family and that's what i did uh, as much as i love doing this channel and as much as, I, as much as i love talking to different fathers and getting different perspectives on fatherhood i still need to be a dad that being said we are back i want to thank everyone who stayed with the channel everyone that asked you when's another episode coming out we want to hear from you we want to hear from you i appreciate you all from the bottom of my heart i really do uh we're gonna take a different direction with the channel uh, we're gonna be switching up a little bit uh i'm still gonna have the interviews with the dads i have a few that i i'm in the process of editing to release soon so stay tuned stay tuned it'll be out soon uh but also i'm gonna do a little bit of reactions to things uh in the media that pertain to fatherhood or pertain to dads uh, i'm gonna do like reaction to those and also bada bum drum roll i'm going to be inviting some women on the podcast just to see and hear from them and their perspective on you know growing up without a father growing up with a father uh the fathers that they have for their children whether they be present and absent trust me guys i know it's still not gonna be uh, a bashing session i'm gonna control this we don't want that type of environment this is a safe space for fathers to uh, listen and learn and motivate others but also we want to hear from the women and get their input as well so stay tuned that might be happening shortly but it's still going to be a lot more fathers on the podcast a lot more fathers on um again because i just want to hear their stories i want to really get to know uh you know the struggles and the accomplishments of being a father um it's, it's going to be great i have big things planned for this channel so just stay tuned again thank you for rocking with me and i apologize for it being so long but it is 2024 and it's a new year and let's get it going uh, with that being said, I'm going to drop that. I'm going to drop that documentary that I made a few years ago. Please don't, don't knock me for the editing. Don't knock me for how it looks. It was very, very early in my videography journey. You know, cameras weren't good. Mics weren't good, uh, but the content was great. So I'm going to release that. Um, after this video so just stay tuned i'm gonna pop that in it's about half hour or so uh but again good, great content you know um yeah so stay with me uh, stay with the channel and if you haven't subscribed subscribe uh we have some big things coming all right so peace Wayne Willis. My name is Fitz Williams II. Nathan. My name is Kevin Chin. Derek Payne. My name is uh, Christopher O. Lewis. Jabari Williams. Three, two girls, one boy. I have three children. Just one. Two. I have one child uh, and seven godkids. I have four children. Oh, this is 15 yesterday, the second one's 14, and the third one is three. Three boys. My first child, 14. My second child, nine. And my third child is four. Girl. Ah, she's five. I have a daughter and a son. One is 10, and one is one year old. Boy, gonna be four this year. That's three boys, one girl. Corey is 11, Judah is 5, Ania Rose is 2, and Asher is 3 months. Girl, that's 5. Yes. Yes. On and off. On and off. Um, grew up with him in Toronto kind of thing. My parents split. Um, I saw him on the weekends up until I think I was about 10. Um, at that point, there was no real communication until maybe my teen years, and once again, it was on and off until 
I want to say my early 20s. So it was on and off, back and forth. Uh, he was there a bit and he wasn't. It did have some effect on me nonetheless, uh, but I was able to make through and see uh, through without. Yes, he was. Definitely, I can say he was there. Uh, as I got older, he kind of did his own thing, but as a young child, he was he was around. We got older here, him and my mother, they went their separate ways, so uh, definitely. But we still kept in touch, still kept in contact. It wasn't like he went astray. I knew where he was, he knew where I was. We, we had a relationship. No, my father wasn't present in my life. Uh, no, uh, my father actually committed suicide when I was six years old after he killed my mom. I did. He was kind of like uh, here, but not there, but there. Always gave us lectures on life and stuff, but he was there. Um, so he was around, um, still plays soccer with like 25 year olds. So he kind of has his own thing. He just, he would lecture us and give us uh, ways to go about going through things in life and how to deal with it. So it's not like we never had a father figure where we can turn and ask questions even now. If I want to sit down, we usually roll up a split, get some juice, sit down and chop it up. It gave me what not to be when I become a father. We'll say he was there, but not consistently. And when he was there, he would be second or third tier to whatever authority I already grew up with mother, grandfather, or mother, grandmother, anybody else. So that's why I say not to be that. Not to be second to nothing when it comes to your kids. It's mother and father, one and two. It, it made me feel, um, made me feel loved and it made me feel like I had someone to look up to. <clears throat> My father was a man who was always present, always home but wasn't very vocal. And it wasn't until my later, my later, later on in life I seen how him just being present impacted me and impacted the way that I behave with my children. So me saying that he was more present than I imagined or that I understood was me saying that he didn't really seem to be present just physically, but then I realized that just that presence alone offered me so much more insight on how to deal with my life and my children's life as I got older. Um, definitely, it has a, a negative connotation towards attitude. Um, I was a lot angrier as a kid, even from right after my parents split, um, to the on and off, back and forth that did occur because uh, as a child, you don't necessarily know the full circumstances as to why they're not there or why they choose to not be there, whatever the case may be. Uh, you just know that they're not there. Uh, so there was a lot of anger and resentment for a while actually in regards to my father that I had um, that I actually didn't get to deal with until my mid-20s. Uh, growing up with him was good at a young age. Uh, as I got older, uh, like I said, him, him and my mother kind of went their ways. So I kind of felt the distance, uh, but it, it was still good knowing that somebody was there. Um, as always, he could have wanted more, but I guess in our community, our culture, we kind of take what we get. <laughs> uh, so my dad was uh, was present as a young age. I did a lot, we, he, he, I played sports, so he was at the games, took me to the games, um, took us shopping, you know, taught us how to ride a bicycle, yeah, we played a lot of uh, outdoor activities in the summertime. So baseball, uh, soccer, like I mentioned before. So in those ways and activities, he was definitely present. Um, he was home, he did a lot of cooking. He, he liked cooking, he was like a chef. We call him a chef. So he was home, he, he cooked for us. He did a lot of stuff that very interactive. So I would say in that respect, he that's how he, he played his part. Now that I'm older, I realize it made me who I am and it also affected my childhood. When you are brought up in an area where there's no fathers, it seems normal. When you get older and realize the importance of a father, then you realize the reason why you were acting a certain way back then was the absence of 
the male figure, the positive male figure that should have been in your life. A little resentment when my father left when I was two years old. My sister at the time was four, so there was a lot more pictures of her as a child from one to four, opposing to me from one to two. And I realized what happened to all my pictures. Um, wasn't I loved or cared about? Um, I have questions about me going through puberty or why am I feeling this way? And it was difficult for me to talk to my mom about this whole situation. Empty, very, very empty. I thought it was my fault for, for the longest time. And I didn't really have a father, I was adopted. So I, and it was just, just a, a mother and her son and then me. Um, I can see where people who don't have their dads in their life could be a little confused with some things. With me having him there, I wasn't really confused about too much in life. I had a question, he already had an answer. He pretty much studied the Bible, went into being an Israelite, so he kind of had an answer for everything, or he can give you some direction on which route you wanted to go. To be active. Morning, breakfast, phone calls, or bring them to school, or bringing them lunch or being there after school for homework or if you're not staying phone calls, Skype, some kind of way of communicating with them daily to each individual to do the best that you can, the best of what you know, the best of what is at your access. If, you're, if it's available to you, use it. Whatever it is you know, do it. Don't just talk it. Being active in my children's life means being there to help them understand themselves and help them understand that they're different than everybody around them and their, and their expectations for them are different than what anybody can put onto them. So I, I'm, I'm just active, my, my main purpose in life is my children and to let them know that their purpose is their own and they can figure out whatever they want to figure out but I just want to encourage them to keep on digging to find themselves. For me, definition of being active is always being there, always supporting um, and just being present in everything you have the ability to be present in. Um, I'm very active in my daughter's life for whatever it is she may need. I do my best to go out and seek it for her. Um, I just feel like I wouldn't want her to have to go through what it is I went through or feel that way. Um, especially seeing my dad has, there's nine of us actually, I the, the third last now and I saw even with the absence of him not being there did to my sister and that's the last thing that I would want my daughter to feel. Currently right now, I'm doing, I'm, I'm learning a lot of new things. So I'm learning to, you know, do, do the park. <laughs> do the park. Um, also, just try to feed on what their interests are, right? My daughter, she's getting to, you know, almost teenager, teenage years right now. So I'm just trying to figure out what she's gravitating to, what she likes and kind of help her blossom in that way. Uh, my son, he's just a little child, but I'm still observing him and seeing what he likes. So I want to do the same thing, but a little bit different. I still want to, you know, be present, take them out, let them see the world, let them see what's going on, not just cooped up in at home and, you know, have them sitting around playing video games and stuff all day. Uh, let them go out there, interact with people. So I would say just doing what my dad did as well, but on another level, uh, as much as I can, a long time space and so on and so forth. My definition of being active in my child's life is being there for him mentally and physically and letting him know that his time with me means more than anything that could happen. So for example, if you tell your child, tell me anything, you won't get in trouble. The relationship that I'm building with my child is he's gonna believe 
the fact that when I say tell me anything, you won't get in trouble, he's gonna understand it. A lot of parents say, tell me you're not gonna get in trouble. Then you get wild out at, and people are wondering like, I'm not gonna tell you everything again because the trust is lost. So also building a trust factor with my child is gonna also help strengthen our relationship. So going through the traps, the downfalls, the mistakes as a team, opposing to a child making mistakes that we already know is gonna happen, allowing him to make that mistakes and allowing him to build from that mistakes. I'm, I could say as much as I want, don't do this, but again, he's gonna do this, so my statement would rather be, if this happens, come to me, we'll figure out what we're gonna do in the future. What it means to me is, for one, being a positive role model, encouraging them with my words, being there for them when they need support, talking to them, figuring out the things that they like, and even if I don't like it, incorporate it in my lifestyle with them. For example, like one of my eldest kids likes comics, and growing up comics, comics wasn't really my thing, but I've learned to, you know, to, to adapt to that, because he likes that. And I think it's extremely important to be active in a child's life, because I know I didn't have, I didn't have that uh, father figure in my life, so I, I try, I be extra, I'm extra diligent in making sure that I'm active in my, ch my children's life. And mostly just being, just being a supporting them, just, just loving them. That's, I think that's the ultimate uh, way to be active in their life, letting them know that you actually love them. Um, being active is very, it's a very big role for me, um, seeing as uh, we grew up with Jamaican parents, and Jamaican parents are not huggy, lovey, touchy like that, so I kind of try to change the demographic of that, so when I pick up my daughter, I try to show her, you know, if you're going to go out there, you're going to have somebody deal with you, they better be better than me, and how I deal with you, or else they're not worth it. Well, her mom tried to actually take her away from me um, after she was done school. I was picking her up every weekend for two years, her first two years of her life. Then her mom tried to take her away from me, so what I had to end up doing was taking her to court, and right now I'm still fighting that process. So I got the uh, visitations, child support, all that good stuff. It's just she doesn't stick to what they're saying, so it's, it's still an ongoing fight at this moment right now. Based on coming from, depending on where it's come from, but at the same time, it's 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 harsh, it's sticky. Like they, a lot of people know of the background of where black men are coming from, of how they grew up, whether it's broken home or not, and they still there's no say lenience or partisan, like something to feel sorry for them. And not say feel sorry, but to help out as opposed to just beating a man while he's down. I feel um, the media's done a good job of putting these stereotypes onto black people and um, putting the images into people's heads of black men and them as parents. Um, I don't let it, I don't let it dictate the way I behave. I know that um, I know that my journey is my journey and I know that the way I deal with my children is, is solid and, and I put full, full effort into it. So um, the stereotypes, I don't let it dictate how I, how I um, deal with my children. I hear that, that um, black men aren't present in their children's lives. I hear that they have multiple children with multiple women. I hear that that they um, they aren't good examples. They don't they don't work. They they're not good examples. They, they, they're hustlers. This all all the, all the images that I see of black men on TV or the majority of black men that they perpetuated on television as parents it seems to be those of struggling men that don't care so much of their children. And um, that's what I see, and that's what, 
and again, like I, I try to ignore that because I don't want to buy into the belief that that is the truth. Uh, I feel that there are definitely stereotypes towards black fathers. Um, black men for sure, most definitely. A little bit more um, on the black father side, there's the whole, well, father, black fathers aren't there. Um, when you look at statistics, that doesn't necessarily add up. It's more of a statement, I feel, that was made. Uh, being a black father amongst other black fathers, I could say that's not an accurate statement. Uh, some of the stereotypes I feel that we face, other than not being there, are that we don't know how to mentor, how to nurture, how to teach. Uh, based on a majority of us, um, just from my experience not having our fathers there, I could say that's a stereotype in itself as you could either have it one of two ways. You could use that as an excuse to not nurture and teach and learn from it um, and continue on the same path, doing the same thing for your child. Or you could use that to empower you, in my opinion, um, to do all the opposite things and realistically use that as a template of what not to do um, to build your child and have your child grow. Well. There's a lot of stereotypes floating around in the atmosphere. Um, I feel that some of them are valid. <laughs> I, I guess at that point it wouldn't really be a stereotype. Um, I would say that we, we do as a collective need to do a better job um, as men, as, as black fathers, as black men. We do need to do a better job and I think in order for us to curb the stereotypes we have to involved in something called communication <laughs> and I think communication is key in terms of relationship because it takes two people to make a child, it takes two for anything to flourish. So if the proper communication is had, um, even if the male and the female, the, they, don't, they don't coexist together, I think the communication lines, once they're open, um, it, can go, it can lead to, to great co-parenting or it can lead to uh, just dispelling these myths of, of black fatherhood and, and, and black men in general. So I feel like the communication line needs to be open and I think we'll start heading to a better solution or possibly just a, uh, an avenue to a solution of some sort. The stereotypes that black fathers face is a, for me, it's bigger than what was told by us. Meaning, the fact that most of the black fathers in the community were imprisoned, separated from the mothers, and then, because even when I ask my mom what happened, she doesn't want to talk about the situation. When you get older, you realize, my dad might have been going through this, my father might have been going through so much pressure just being a black man, that my mother wouldn't even be able to understand it. And the stereotype behind them being absent, there could be a reason or there could have been a solution if there was help or other people talking about what they're going through at the time. So I think with the stereotype of they were upset, they were bad, they left, they're not there, if now we sat down with our fathers and had a conversation and say, hey, yo, let me know what happened when you were 21, married in a country where racism was still involved, where police brutality was okay to happen, where there was no TV cameras, there was no one for you to turn to. What happened? How did you feel? And how did you deal with it? It would be a totally different conversation than coming from one side of the story. Most of us don't know the side that our fathers had to deal with at the time of the 70s, 60s, even 80s. Well, the stereotypes is they're not there. Uh, and I, I think it's more for me, I like to think more spiritual. So I know it's, it's a spiritual thing. So I think there's an enemy that's trying to destroy the family. Um, so whether it be black, white, Chinese, Okay, whatever it is, the, the plan is to destroy the family, to take the father out of the, out of the picture, which will then break the family foundation. So to, 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 to label it a stereotype for, 
for a black father and stuff like that. I see it way big. I think it's way bigger than just black. I think it's to, to tear down the family as a whole. It doesn't matter where you're from or what color. Because to me, there's there's no black, there's no white. You know, I think we're all spiritual beings. We're all beings of light. So this is just a flesh suit. Well, my daughter lives in Barry, so even with the court process that I'm going through now, I thought it would be more of a, a race thing. It is a race thing, but it's uh, very sexual as well. So, like, uh, when guys go in there, it doesn't matter what your occupation is, how you come in there looking, if you have all your tax documents, at the end of the day, they still see a black guy or a guy who doesn't take care of his kids, where, you know, that kind of gets you upset in, in, a, in a sense, because even when I go to court, I got to keep to how I grew up of mother and father. Mother was number one, daddy was number two, mommy was more aggressive. Mommy's choice in the field of money making her career was one of the wisest. As opposed to father, his was more wise but not as productive or he didn't deal with his way with the potential of any one of us could have if we have our career. I'd say I'm been digging my way up. I'm glad I'm not where I was. I'm not reached where I want to be yet, but I'd say I came out from the negative to more positive. I fall right into the stereotype. I personally fall right into the stereotype. If someone was to look at me and not know me, but see my circumstance, I would fit the stereotype. But I am not the stereotype. I personally have three children with three different women. Now, looking at that, I would have never imagined that would have been my life, but my circumstances have ended me up in that situation. Um, I'm not upset about it, I deal with it. I deal with it as the hand that I've been given. Um, it would seem like if I tell somebody I have three children with three, three different women, they'd say, oh, you're the stereotype. And I can understand why they think that because I fit them all. But um, it wasn't purposeful. It was three failed relationships. And I just, I just count myself as a blessing to the children that were born because I feel like my purpose was to, to be there for them, to allow them to be the best people that they can be when they get older. So I, I, I fit the stereotype when you look at it, but I don't fit the stereotype because I don't believe it. I don't necessarily feel I fall into a stereotype uh, per se. I do think that there are some difficulties along the way that we do face as black fathers. Um, and once again, that stems from not necessarily having a father figure to show us how to nurture. So we're realistically, in my opinion, starting from scratch. Um, with the majority of the black fathers that I could say um, and know having to go from what we've learned from our mothers, our grandmothers, aunts, uncles, grandparents, or whatever the case may be, I feel like there is a more of a learning curve um, for us per se than necessarily someone who's had their father there and may have got that nurturing and has that, I guess you could say, that little bit of knowledge as to what a man should be in his child's life. Personally, I don't fall into the stereotypes. Uh, I'm grateful for that. I think a big part of that was just seeing a lot of people within my family even just experiencing these uh, stereotypes and having seen it and not wanting to fall in line with that. Um, seeing family members who, who don't have their father around so I kind of stepped in in that role and kind of step, stepped up in that respect. So I personally, just of my, my own upbringing, seeing that has not allowed me to fall into that stereotype. I mean, if there's another, if there's another category that I might fall into subcategory, I hope I don't, but I don't think I fall into any of those categories presently. Yes. Like, I feel that I fall in some stereotypes as a black father in the sense that if I go to a school, they look at me as, wow, you're his dad? Like, he has a father, he has somebody in his life 
that he calls daddy and he's comfortable saying that word and it's weird that in 2019 or even in the 2000s that other ethnicities are still thinking that the black father is still absent is mind-blowing to me 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 personally no because i mean i'm there for my children uh, even my eldest is technically not mine but i've given him my last name he has my last name and he's been grafted into the lewis right so i i, I don't it doesn't doesn't face me really i don't fit into that because the world can't define me what my father said my heavenly father says about me that i'm i'm high i'm, I'm blessed i'm favored i'm loved i'm more than a conqueror you know that's what defines me his word that's what defines me so people can say what they want because i mean my wife is caucasian so people say well with a white woman it, that to me it doesn't matter because it's it's all about love right and we have a beautiful family with this court case right now, I like I went to court two years ago, and I've been fighting this case for my daughter. Uh, my lawyer totally screwed my whole case up. Like uh, she put in the financial portion of what I was supposed to pay, but she didn't put in anything that had to do with access to my daughter. And that was just done January of this year. This is two years later. So I mean, the struggle is ongoing. Nobody out there listens to you because even when I was saying, you know, my paperwork's wrong. How much you guys say I make is wrong, the way you guys uh, conducted the case or gave me my access was wrong. Nobody listens to you, so you kind of, you know, can't give up because it falls on deaf ears all the time. It's you that has to push yourself to go the next level to make sure someone's hearing you or you're heard. Try my best not to be narrow-minded into how people think of me or what they may think of us as black fathers. Try to take every opportunity that is there, such as being here today. Um, and talk with the children, like, to be there, whether it's, it doesn't have to be just your kids, your nephew, your nieces, your friend, your godson, your goddaughter. Try to keep it positive in no matter what it is. When you were growing up and you always said, think of the positive, leave the negative. Don't think that we always look for the silver lining. Well, you gotta focus on that, you gotta believe in that. By helping them or teaching them based off of your experience. Depending on their age, you can't always just tell them things straight and right out as it is. You always have to word it differently or approach it differently or show differently, whether it's your children or not. Whether it longs you're at your someone in that child's life whatever stage or importance or significance, you always have to stay positive and show them the positive. No matter how they feel about the situation or subject at hand, but like even as homework, they like art because they love to color and draw, so that's easy, they don't want your help. They just use their head. And then when it's math, then they're gonna complain and have problems, but you gotta show them the positive in that. They gotta show them well, the same colors you're using, you gotta count that. So if you'd be able to count that and count the money that you wanna make to buy those things, need to put the same amount of energies here or more than so you can get this to that level. Well, I'm, I'm constantly present. I'm constantly present. I'm constantly um, in my children's lives, encouraging them, teaching them. I'm, what, 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 I, what I do is try to make my children be the best that they can be. And if I'm not working, then my time is with my children. And, I'll, and, and it's not like just playing around or whatnot, it's, it's teaching them, it's, it's developing their brain, it's, it's making them do things that they don't want to do so that they can come out of, so that they can realize that they can do things that they never thought that they could do. So like for instance, um, yesterday I gave my son a, a job to, to learn how to edit video on Premiere, Adobe Premiere, and um, that was his job. I said, one, once you learn how to do this, then then um, every video you edit, you get 25 bucks, right? So it's it's something that he never thought he could do, but now that he's learned it, he was so anxious to let me know that he learned it and he edited a video, and that's why I wanted I want him to keep on learning different things. And um, my other children, like I just I just keep on instilling new goals for them 
so that they can so that they can reach them. I just I just want I don't want any stagnation with them. I just want them to keep on understanding that learning and developing is just the process. And I believe once once that happens, then then the stereotypes will be broken. Because if I if I can impact my child like that and they can impact their their friends like that, then the stereotypes stereotypes and the chains that, that are put on us will definitely be crushed. Um, just my daughter's smile alone, realistically, is what keeps me going. I feel that if I was to continue along the same path and continue the pattern that was set, it wouldn't necessarily benefit her nor any of the other black children that she may be able to empower along the way. Uh, so I feel that just always being there for her and having the ability to parent her and upbring her um, is what would help, I guess you could say, set her on the right path. Well, for me, my, my daughter is five and I do my very best to set her standards from now as for her to know what it is a man should be doing. Um, as small as she is, I'm, you know, I open the door for her, I pull out her chair for her. Um, I have her know what it is to feel loved and that you just don't need materialistic things and necessarily materialistic things do not equal love. I feel that if I'm to promote all of the things that I would like to see for her to find in a husband and set that standard from she's young as she is now, that she'll be able to grow in um, be well informed and knowledgeable as to make those decisions as to what it is to look for it within a man. What I'm doing currently right now is just trying to spend as much time as possible with my children and learn them. I think the biggest problem is that a lot of black fathers don't know their children just because they're not there. And if they're not there, how can you know what they like, what they don't like, what's age appropriate for them? Um, just putting gifts is not enough. There was a point in time in my life where I got a lot of gifts, but that's not really what I truly wanted. It was more time, it was valuable conversation, and those are the key things, especially growing up as a teenager, as a young black, uh, black boy, turning into a man, you wanna have those conversations. After a while, the gifts and the, the, the glitter start to fade away. So I think for myself, I try to give as much quality uh, time and conversations uh, as much as possible to help my children know that, hey, it's not just about gifts and, and games. There's other side to the, to the coin as well. And balance that. You have, to do, you have to do both, but you can't go heavy one way and heavy the other way. That's how I feel. Well, well right now, I'm just trying to show them as much as possible, like I said earlier, broaden their perspectives, take them out, let them see the world so they can start to have a, a, as they get older, a better understanding of things. And my son, he's one, I think he's, I think he's been home for what, one whole weekend. <laughs> you know, every weekend we're going somewhere, we're visiting people, uh, we're visiting family, and he just out, he sees a lot of things, we take him grocery shopping with us. There's a lot of things, so I have an interaction with different people at a young age, uh, it helps you little things with vocabulary. So I think just me trying to be interactive with them and show them more than just what's in their in their current environment uh, will help break some of the stereotypes and hopefully down the line they don't fall into anything that you know is being said out there. I mean we don't know what the future holds, but that's what I'm doing in my part to make sure that these things are, are preventable. What I'm trying to do to change the stereotypes that they face is actually in 2020, and you guys are the first to hear it, I'm gonna do a father and son dinner where we're gonna form a fraternity where it's almost like an outreach program for the fathers that are dealing with certain stereotypes could speak about and with their son build stronger relationships and bonds that there's much more father and son combinations in this year now than ever before and the strength is should be and will be unbreakable for my son not to fall in that stereotype i just need to be present in his life regardless of any type of situation at any type of situation until 
he decides to bury me, I'm going to be there regardless of the relationship I have with his teacher, his mother, his grandparents, his other side of the family and my side of the family. As long as he knows that every day he wakes up and I wake up, we're together and we're a strong unit or a unit that could still build on growth. He's going to understand that I'm there and there's going to be no type of stereotype. Also mentally, I'm going to just train my son to be extremely, or if I have more children, to be extremely tough and wise at the situation. This might be what they want you to believe. This is going to be the truth. You need to know the truth of the situation and by him talking to me and us having a conversation, a daily conversation, I'm gonna program his mind to let him know coming from his father is stronger than coming from any other source that he could possibly get from. Well, every day, when I, pretty much every day when I drop them to school, I, I, I have them, in, I get them to say that they are more than a conqueror, that they are loved, you know, that, that they're forgiven, that they're beautiful, that they're fearfully and wonderfully made. Uh, I have them pray for, pray for their teachers, their classmates. So I instill principles of love inside of them. And I encourage them to always to look with the eyes of love. And most importantly, they, they, they have to see their father live that way. Yes, all my kids know. Uh, Ania Rose, who's two, and Asher is just three months. They really can't comprehend. Uh, but as far as Corey and Judah, um, the fiber of Judah, he's. He's kind of like, wow, your parents are dead, like, you know, but the, the, the eldest one, he, he understands it. And, how, and what, what keeps me going, to be honest, their, their smile, their, but my kids, it brings me so much joy. Because like, I was adopted and I always desired a bigger family. I always desired my own family and a big family. So just every day when I see them, they smile, they call me daddy. They all say they love me every day without me doing anything like that. To me, that's the greatest reward. And I have to thank my Heavenly Father for that because, you know, like losing your parents to such a tragic situation, that, that's hard, hurtful. And uh, now I have my family of my own and now I can just basically rebrand the Lewis name and mostly depending on, and it's always gonna be dependent on righteousness as a foundation, Christ as a foundation. There won't be no other foundation that can be laid but Christ. So that's how, that's how I get by. Just a, a beautiful smile. Um, I wish I had a bigger platform to tell you the truth. Like I'm an admin in a group and we bring awareness to it. We have uh, kids days where we get fathers together. It doesn't just have to be fathers. Anybody with their kids that want to come out and have some fun. Uh, we go to like the jump in place, we go to Chuck E. Cheese for the weekend. Like we just, we don't want anybody to be left back or we don't want a kid that not have a father figure. So we try our damnedest to do what we can do to impact the community as best as we can when it comes to father figures.